there, and thank you for tuning in to Democracy Under Threat. I am Vanelda Harris, and with me is the former Attorney General under the People's Progressive Party Civic Administration, Mr. Anil Nandalal. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of your program and permit me to greet your guests, your sorry, your listeners and your viewers, and let me thank them for joining us in this discourse. Great. So, Anil, the first thing I want you to do is to update the viewers on what has been going on at GCOM with the with getting the recount on the way. We know that yesterday the chair was supposed to make her final decision, but instead what we saw was an email coming out of GCOM where that was actually very ambiguous. She failed to address a lot of the critical issues. Um, she did not provide a date for commencement, a date of con completion. All she merely said was that no more than 10 working stations and could not even provide a definite number of working stations. All right, perhaps a convenient point to begin is to highlight that an election is only completed in accordance with the law until the final results are declared in the statutorily required manner and that the person elected as president is declared the president. That is how an election concludes. So for all intent and purposes, the March 2nd Regional and General Elections 2020 of Guyana has not yet been completed. The elections are still ongoing because the results have not been declared and a person has not been elected and declared to be so elected as the President of Guyana. Neither have seats been allocated to the parties based upon the number of votes they would have received at the elections. So the point is that the elections are far from completed. And I must say to you <coughs> and to the viewers that I have researched this issue and in over 200 years of recorded history in electoral democracies, barring wars and barring natural disasters, no election has ever taken so long to be completed. So we are already in the record book. And this in which we are engaged, this dilemma in which we are engaged, will further besmirch our already damaged electoral history. Because we are a country since independence to 1992 has had successive rigged elections under the governance and direction of the People's National Congress. We come back, they are in government again for the first time after 23 years in 2015 and the first elections that they have held under their watch is again embroiled in allegation of fraud and embroiled in a never-ending kind of controversy. It is not a coincidence. It is an act, a deliberate design by the PNC as they execute what they know to be politics. Their politics include rigging of elections, include fraudulent design, include not working hard, include not delivering on promises, include failing on manifesto and platform promises, but yet want to remain in government illegally by hook or by crook. And what we are seeing unfolding here is the PNC in its natural characterization. We must also never forget the antecedents to these elections because the rigging process by the PNC did not commence on after the elections at Ashmin building with Mingo. It started long before that. It started with the appointment, the unconstitutional, unilateral, illegal, unlawful appointment of James Patterson as the chairperson of GCOM. The constitution was tossed aside, it was abrogated, it was violated so that the president can get his own man 
Although the Constitution says that his power to choose is circumscribed to a list of names provided to him by the leader of the opposition after consulting wider society. You know, and your viewers will know, that 18 names of distinguished Guyanese were presented to Mr. Granger, and he rejected them all. We presented doctors, we presented lawyers, we presented former judges, current judges, uh, army chiefs, pilots, engineers, ambassadors, teachers, professors, all sorts of people coming from every conceivable direction, all of whom had distinguished themselves in their respective endeavors in national life in this country. And they were all rejected as unfit and improper by David Granger because he had his own man. And why did he want Patterson? It is because Patterson was to carry out that sinister, illegal, unlawful, and undemocratic design of the PNC. And Patterson attempted to do so while he was there. And that is how he commenced this unlawful house-to-house -house registration. Recall the idea was, the intention was to scrap the existing database and to produce a new list of registrants and they would have contaminated, they would have skewed, and they would have subverted the process in such a way that they would have left out of the registration exercise tens of thousands of persons whom they believe were not their supporters. So we would have had a half-baked list of national registrants from which the voters', voters list would have eventually been extracted. And what we, would have, what we would have had there is elections almost being rigged before it even started because a substantial number of the electorate would have been unlawfully left off the list. We had to fight that in the court. And we fought and we won, fortunately. Then you cannot also discount the fact that they, they lost the local government elections of 2016. They lost even more resoundingly the local government elections of 2018 and then they lost the no confidence motion in the National Assembly making their government completely illegal after the CCJ would have ruled. And they continued in that state of unlawfulness until Granger was forced to fix a date for the March 2nd elections. So they did not get to accomplish the foundation of building a foundation to rig so they had to improvise because elections day you had a number of observers and it all went fairly you know decently because so many people with cell phones it's not that they didn't wish to rig on elections day but they were prevented from doing that because of the heavy public scrutiny to which they were subject so they had to pull this plan out of their hat and, and they thought that the tabulation process in Region 4 would have presented them with that opportunity and they found a willing ally in Mingo whom they brought from Barbies to work for the first time in Demerara and he was supposed to carry out that wicked design so and then we all know what happened with Mingo and then they had to go to court again and then Mingo violated the court order and then we had a the flawed and false declarations made then we had a whole long agonizing process of public condemnation, the intervention of CARICOM, uh, five heads of government from CARICOM, the international condemnation, the threat of sanctions from all the international, from the international community, including powerful governments in North America, and the avalanche of pressure finally got to Cloud Singh, and she gave an undertaking in one of the court proceedings, followed up with a public statement that she will do a recount. That was, and a, a, a GCOM meeting was held on the 15th of uh, March at where that decision was baptized. By that time, another initiative intervened emanating from CARICOM. Mia Motley, the chairperson of CARICOM, the Honorable Prime Minister of Barbados, was able to get from Mr. Granger an undertaking that he will agree to the recount. Mr. Jagdeo, of course, signed on to that agreement and the GCOM was supposed to, and CARICOM also agreed to have a high-level team 
be part of the exercise to do the recount. And this was Granger's initiative. The, the statement itself said that. Lo and behold, when this recount was about to begin, we were written to by Lowenfield and told that Tuesday afternoon the recount will begin at 5 p.m. By Monday, they rushed to the court used under the thin disguise of um, a private citizen who we later learned were, was a candidate of theirs as well as using their, uh, their, their party lawyers they rushed to the court and managed to secure from a judge three injunctions stopping the recount from taking place and we have been stopped we had to await the conclusion of that litigation and obviously they lost as, as they have lost everything in the process they lost the court proceedings and the way was eventually cleared once again for the recount to take place. Each uh, team, each, both the government commissioners as well as the opposition commissioners were requested to present proposals on the modalities to, to, for the recount to proceed. And then of course, you had the infamous proposal coming from Keith Lowenfield. And I want to pause here to say, that Keith Lowenfield is part and parcel of the problem. He is as tainted as Mingo is, and so are other persons in the Secretariat, whom have been identified by name in the International Observer's reports. Uh, Mingo is one of them, Roxanne Myers is one of them, Mingo is one of them. They have all, all been identified as persons who are in this conspiracy to derail the 2020 elections. So Lowenfield, of course, was tasked with responsibility and through the form, Lowenfield produces a proposal that says that it will take 156 days for the recount to be concluded. Now, obviously that is preposterous and we had to reject that. We, that was rejected out of hand. But the other aspects of it was basically adopted by Alexander and presented as the government's position. And there has always been a consistency between low and field positions and postures in the commission, and not now, but historically, and the position that emanates from the government. Somehow or the other, low and field positions on whatever issue always coincides with that of the government and the government commissioners at GCOM. So there's no doubt in people's mind anymore that Lowenfield is contaminated, he's damaged goods, and he must be removed from the process. So the PPP commissioners presented their uh, report, a very detailed document, to the secretary, to the commission, for the commission's um, consideration. Significantly, in our report, we highlighted a couple of things. One, we said that the process of a recount is a legal process. It's not an arbitrary, administrative, political exercise. It's a legal exercise. And the law speaks to how a recount is to be done. The steps of how a recount is to be executed are laid down in the Representation of the People Act in a very elaborate fashion. So if you're going to do that recount, and one would expect that Claudette Singh being a former judge of some three decades standing, one would think that she would find great attraction to the law that speaks to the very issue in which they are engaged. We are not seeing that. We are not seeing that from her. So that's the first point I want to make about our proposal. Secondly, our proposal puts a period to this exercise, a time frame. No one feels one six months. We put forward a proposal that will ensure the conclusion of the process within 14 days maximum. And we say that that can be achieved by counting 20 stations at a time, 20 ballot boxes at a time. We also gave a, um, a recommendation in terms of the time that should be spent per ballot box. We pointed out that there are some ballot boxes that have 50 ballots. So it can take 
one hour to count. So the ballot boxes will not take the same period of time. You have over a thousand ballot boxes with about a hundred ballots only. So you can't have a uniform period hour or for to spend on one ballot box. It will vary. Also, we spoke to the need for transparency to be a major feature of the exercise because we know that if the process is not transparent then there is going to be the likelihood of rigging and fraud again so we are recommending that the process not only be absorbed by the international observers but that it be live streamed or telecast or both then we want a clear rule or procedure to ensure that the parties, representatives and the observers get a, a, a platform to effectively scrutinize the process. That mere presence can't be enough. It's not a sterile exercise. It's an exercise that has to be effective. We all scoot, we were all present when Mingo did the wickedness that he did because he denied us the opportunity to effectively scrutinize. So it's not about calling the party representative and having the international observer team there in an impotent role. They must be allowed to participate in an effective way to make their presence felt so to speak as i said it's not a sterile process so we have to be able to oversight in particular not only to ensure that they are using the state principle as the basis for the tabulation but also that they are inputting the data from the state principle into the computer accurately or else we will get shaft again so our proposal spoke to that as well and we had a number of other important components that we addressed frontally. And we thought that our, our, our proposals, I mean, it's our proposals, obviously, we bear a prejudice, but it has been scrutinized by the international community. And we have had good feedback. First of all, it is in accordance with law, that's the first thing. And secondly, where the law is silent, we ensured that we put proposals that are reasonable. And when you compare it with the other side, all you get from the other side are proposals which are designed to delay, to frustrate. For example, Alexander wants an audit to be done. What, what are you auditing? Nobody asks for an audit. The law doesn't speak to an audit. The law speaks to a recount. Can recount spoke to a recount? The, the, the chairperson gave an undertaking to do a recount. Where is audit? I don't even know what, what are you auditing. Well, count, I don't know if, if counting the ballots, because that is what you have to do. It's 487,000 pieces of paper, there about the number. It is like eight, eight, $487,000 bills. You don't have to reckon them one by one. My God, any school, any nursery school child can do that. We are using terminology such as audit and all sorts of things. And the law tells you how you must open the envelopes when you open the ballot box what must happen and how you take out the envelopes how you take out the materials out of the envelope how you record the contents of the envelope how you reckon the balance and how you pack back the envelope the law tells you every step of the way how the process is to be done so we are befuddled that the law is not being observed or embraced by this former judge. So our proposals and the proposals from the other side were taken by the, the, uh, the chairperson and she promised that she will email her response on the competing issues. And as you correctly pointed out in the beginning of the program, it's just a singular issue that she has written on, which is counting no less than 10 ballot boxes at a time 
even that is not um, not not adequately expressed even on that issue because so all the other issues that we have raised who will count it are you going to use the very contaminated staff at GCOM or you will accept our proposal of using a political persons outside of the secretariat preferably a private and auditing form an international auditing form if you wish or the auditor general office but certainly removing from the exercise the highly toxic persons like Lowenfield, Mingo and Roxanne Myers. They are no knowns. So her proposal is silent on that. Then her proposal is silent on how long the exercise will take. Is it going to be like what Lowenfield said, or six months? You, you, we must understand that international observers, including the CARICOM high-level team, are prepared to come back. But they will not come back to an open-ended open exercise, an exercise that has no data conclusion. So we have to get that ironed out. Then we must know the staff that you're using. And we must know, most importantly, the mechanism for oversight, as I spoke about earlier and whether the process is going to be transparent and is going to be streamed live. The chairperson, I understand, is complaining that she's under a lot of pressure, and perhaps she is, understandably so, because when you lack decisiveness in decision-making, and when you refuse to exercise the powers conferred upon you by law and the Constitution, then you are going to get yourself the problems. If you want to find solutions by compromise then you're going to, and, 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 and those compromises uh, conflict with the law then you're going to find yourself in problems if you're going to try to find compromises where compromise doesn't exist because you have two sides that are operating at two extremities one wants to come to be done and the other the other side doesn't want to come to be done how can you find a compromise there and I believe that that is her dilemma. And the quicker she extricates herself from that conundrum, the better for her, her credibility, and the process. So, as you said, the process is, the, the, the chairperson's response has been totally inadequate to meet the current situation. And as a result, the leader of the opposition has, I have written, to the chairperson today, the letter was just emailed. It will be made public shortly. And in that letter, I'm writing on behalf of the leader of the opposition. We articulated in a very elaborate fashion what our position positions are on the various issues that we have outlined, most of which I have dealt with. And we are seeking public clarification from the chairperson as quickly as possible because we can't move forward in this opaque state in which we are in, where nobody knows how the process will manifest itself. This is not a Claudette Singh process. This is a process belonging to people. It's a public process which involves the nation state of this country and the future of tens of thousands of lives of Guyanese people. Therefore, one can't sit in some back room and make decisions and then do not expect to get public condemnations, criticisms, and ridicule. So, I am hoping that once the letter is received and a more mature and magnanimous mind is brought to bear on the matter, we will have a more informed response from the chairperson uh, uh, earlier than later because as you know we are coming dangerously close to the time when parliament is to resume and a new parliament has to start in accordance with the constitution so there are legal implications there as well and in any event this country has been in a state of crisis and chaos brought about 
not only by COVID-19 virus, but also by the intransigence of GCOM and their failure to discharge their constitutional and legal mandate and obligation to the people of this country. And adding to what you said, uh, the international observers actually, to be specific, the OAS election observer mission, they actually made a statement saying, asking for the corrupt and biased persons who have been proven during the electoral process to be excluded completely from being anywhere close to the recount process. I, 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 yes, and that's why I said persons were identified. I, I was referring to those statements. And you know, still support, I, I mean, I, sometimes I feel sorry, really, really sorry for supporters of the AP and UAFC. And that's what I'm saying. You know, I said on a program last night that perhaps this is what it takes and this is what it will take to remove the PNC permanently from the political landscape of this country. Because they have become like an abscess. And hopefully when we cut out this abscess after this process is concluded, it will be gone forever. Because I can't imagine that an intelligent population like ours will ever find persons in this rigging cabal and I speak of the AP and UAFC for the avoidance of doubt, the politicians in that ensemble, I can't imagine that they will ever be found electable or attractive for election in the near future. At least not in my lifetime. I believe in the collective intelligence of my people. I believe in the collective intelligence of Guyanese. We are a very, very intelligent people. All of us may not have academic certification but we are a bright people and I can't imagine that we are going to be so blinded by racial and other prejudices that we are still going to support a band of people who not only neglected us while they were in government and who were not only corrupt and not only discriminated against us and were so ineffective as a government but who are trying actively in front of the whole world to steal an entire government and then is are willing to expose us to international sanctions by trying to hold on to power and destroy this country and using the thin guise of racism and some racial insecurity as their platform for squatting in office further they have done nothing for the constituency that they purport to represent. Nothing. I walk the length and breadth of this country like every other politician, or perhaps more than most. And I can tell you, in all the constituency across this country, in all the ethnic villages, I have been there and I've spoken to the people. And this government has neglected from one end of this country to the other. Their friends, like the owner of Ocean View Hotel, is benefiting. Their friends like Brian Tiwari, who got a wharf that valued 20 million US for 500,000 US, they are benefiting. Ocean View, that man is a financier and was on the list, I'm told. Ocean View Hotel is not valued a billion dollars, but this government is prepared to spend a billion dollars to repair it while paying 22 million dollars a month rent. While the very people who they are supposed to represent and whose backs they are riding. They have those people in the sun from morning till night to cost me when I'm going to court in these political matters and to protest in front of GCOM without a bottle of water. But their friends and their cronies in high places have millions. You see there's a news report yesterday implicating a number of ministers of this government in a money laundering probe in the United States. You saw that? Yes. That is what they are doing. And that is what they are doing in government. And a lot of them also will find themselves in serious legal problems when they, this process finally comes to an end. Because there are billions and billions of dollars that they will have to account for which have been unlawfully spent by them. There are multi-billion dollar contracts and large swaths of lands have been given out to their cronies 
and to their friends and they're taking money under the table illegally unlawfully without complying with the legal process they will have to answer to these at some point in time and there is a strong view that that is why they are holding on for their life but every rope has an end and we are coming to the end and we are not going to give up I want to assure PPP supporters, Guyanese, the international community and all those who have championed the cause of democracy to say that we are not going to give up. We will eventually get them out and the full force of the law will be applied to those who acted in violation of the law, especially during this period. Now, Anil, we know, as you mentioned, that the deadline for the sitting of Parliament after its dissolution, which was actually done on December 30th, 2019, so the next sitting of Parliament should be by April 30th. And with all of the shenanigans going on, with getting the recount done, should that deadline not be met, what are the implications of that? Fortunately, the law, I always say, that the law is the greatest institution mankind has created. You can tell me about the computer, you can tell me about internet, you can tell me about telephone, you can tell me about motor cars and aeroplanes. But let me tell you, the greatest, the greatest thing that the mankind has created is the law. It is what keeps us all alive. It's what protects the computer. It's what protects all the inventions that the scientists have made. And this law caters for almost every conceivable eventuality. And the law has deep and abiding common sense as its rationale. Now, that is why the law says that any time a time is fixed, for doing an act, that time frame is always directory and not mandatory. What that means is that the law in its wisdom understands that you may have a situation arising induced by man or caused by unforeseen forces of nature that prevents an act from being done within the time prescribed. And the law says when such an eventuality arises, then that time frame fixed by the law must be flexed to accommodate, to meet the exigencies of that situation. What well, all of that means in one sentence is that the time frame, not uh, the time frame if it is not met, it will not have any deep and great legal consequences. So Parliament will have to sit at the time when it is possible to sit in violation of those time frames and adjustments will have to be made. We are also coming to time frames in terms of when a budget has to be presented. The last budget that was presented was presented for the financial year of 2019 in 2018. It was presented, if you recall, just before the No Confidence Motion. The 2019 budget was presented at the end of 2018. So we have had a, one financial year. A uh, financial year begins from the 1st of January and ends on the 31st of December in accordance with our constitution. And that financial year has come to an end and we have not had a budget presented. And the time for presenting a budget, which is a three months period, has expired. So we have even more problems than people are thinking out there. But I don't talk about these things, you know, when they come up, you answer them. But you try not to put people under more stress and more pressure. There are layers and layers of illegalities and unconstitutionalities that are occurring every single day. That simple contract with that they enter into with the... Um, the, the, no, no, I read the lobbying for me. Okay. The Ocean View International Hotel. Mm -hmm. The law clearly says that you have to go to public tendering. And if you don't go to public tendering, that process, that, that entire contract is illegal. And those who fail to comply with that law are liable to be charged for a criminal offense. 
So every single day, I see offenses being committed, criminal acts of criminality is being perpetuated at the level of this government. But you know, you hope that at some point in time you will take charge of the country once again, put it back on constitutional tracks, and let the law take its course in dealing with those who offended the law. Okay, so um, the next thing that I want you to talk about before we wrap up the program is the dossier that was actually prepared by APNU AFC with a lot of misrepresentations of what actually took place with Guyana's electoral process and the lies and misinformation that is being peddled in that dossier and the the fact that Harmon, who was pointed out in the actual contract that we saw, filed at the U.S. Department of Justice as a point person, he said that the government hired the lobby firm to defend the government of Guyana and that their upset supporters are the ones funding that. And then the very next day we heard Granger, who seems to be a president that never knows anything. He never knows anything that is going on, claiming that the lobbying firm was not hired by the government and he has absolutely no knowledge of that. No. <laughs> I mean, it is a, a recognized fact that this bunch, the AP and new AFC cabal in government, it's a recognized fact, an axiomatic fact, that they are among the most incompetent assemble, assembly of people ever, ever. There's no doubt in my mind about that. But every time, with every passing day, you become absolutely stupefied at the extent of the incompetence. For them to believe that they can get any company in the world, I don't care which company, any company in the world, to change the narrative of what transpired on March the 2nd or what transpired after March the 2nd in relation to Ming One Region 4 results. If they think that they can get anybody to come and change that narrative, then you have to be a special human being. You, you, you have gone beyond the, beyond the state of stupidity. You are special, you are unique. And these people are unique. Because what happened there was seen. I, keep, I see some people, but I don't bother with them because they are they're ill-advised. They say produce the evidence of the rigging. I am the evidence of the rigging. I don't produce anything. I saw the rigging with my own eyes. And so did all the ambassadors, so did all the international observers, so did every person in that building. And who are not in the room, they could have seen from outside because they choose to ring an election in a glass room. That is, the glass is transparent. And people have their, <laughs> people have their phones recording and streaming this thing live. You can go on the World Wide Web and retrieve uh, perhaps every minute of the day in relation to this incident. You can, it's out there, recorded. Any company that is worthwhile, any company that has a reputation, any company that has a high professional standing will never accept such a brief. That's the first thing. The fact that that company has accepted the job in my mind, means that that company is mediocre. It's like some lawyers, they accept any case because they don't get work. You understand? I mean, I'm not talking to anybody. But, <laughs> so this is not a bad company. That's the first thing. To, uh, to think, first of all, to think that these guys who did it, who made the decision to hire the forum, first they are special. To think that they can get somebody to do this. And the forum, who is supposed to be an expert in changing narratives have to also be of the same mental caliber 
to think that they can pull out the stunt. You understand? <laughs> and then it would appear so Harman et al. and the grouping, this bright grouping of people didn't expect that everything will blow up. They didn't expect because they put now I see a backpedaling and they are saying it's not the government of Guyana. It's what AP and UAFC. But why does the document stay in the government of Guyana? Why does it stay? So why doesn't it stay the General Secretary of APNU? Mm -hmm. Of which Harman is. Or the General Secretary of the AFC. Why does it say that? Why does it say David Granger leader? But it says president. Why does it say Moses Dagamotu, former AFC member? But it says prime minister. It doesn't say Joseph Harman, General Secretary of APNU. It says head of the presidential secretary of whatever office he owns. Why does it say that? And you believe that you would not get flack for this? I am telling you that these people are special. They are special. And that is why when the work is now being done, the research is being done for that company. It's some company that has no reputation. A company that was once hired by somebody in Sudan to defend allegations of genocide. So it's not a company that has any standing anywhere. And that is why the rip have you looked, have you seen the report? Yes, I have. You see some of the sources that are cited? Mm -hmm. One of them is Bidemon Scott. Excuse my language, but that is one of the sources that they refer to in the document as what it is. where they get their information from is a Facebook site or something like that or a Facebook page but that is in the document so it's a completely mediocre document completely mediocre document and, and then you have now Harman distancing himself from the document Granger distancing himself from the document. Harman now says that is some over enthusiastic supporter who did it. So this man without telling Harman and without telling Ranger, he just went to this forum and hired his forum. But it had a whole set of official documents as part of the appendices. Where did this guy get his document from? It's just like how when they hired a farmer in Barbies. A man named Reed, Compton Reed, to challenge Charanda's dual citizenship. He's a cassava farmer from New Amsterdam. That's how he described himself in the affidavit. And this man was able to get Charanda's naturalized papers, citizenship certificate, copy of Charanda's passport, all from Canada. And this is a man who planted cassava in Bobby's. <clears throat> so special are these groupings of people. That's the point I'm making. Nothing they can do properly. Absolutely nothing. So is they're moving from one disaster after another because of their incomparable incompetence. And they, they, they better stop doing anything. They, they, to me, they should just stop doing everything and wait till this exercise complete. Because anything that they attempt to do, anything that they attempt to do, erupts into a scandal anything including taking measures for the covid virus every single measure they have implemented has been the subject of public condemnation every single one the decision to prohibit the importation of, um, of, of, of pharmaceutical material by private company the fact that Walter Lawrence wanted to see the medical before the doctor see the medical from the lab the, the, the fact that they want to determine whether they can burn down your house. The fact that they are using the, the, the convention center as this place to, 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 to quarantine people. Every single decision they have made has been rifed in, 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 in a rooted in scandal. Not a single decision can they make that's correct. And that is their nature. That is because of the, the level of incompetence that has enveloped them. And it's getting progressively worse. It's getting progressively worse. Everything that they attempt to do continues to blow up in their faces. Every single thing. Uh, Anil, I want to thank you for joining me on the program today and for giving us a lot of insight. I'm sure the viewers are happy to 
be able to understand a lot of the complexities with all that is going on. So yours, thank you for watching. And uh, Anil, any final words? I just want to thank you for inviting me to be part of this discussion. I want to thank the viewers and listeners for um, accommodating us in their, in their homes. And I want to complain to you as the host that this place is ridiculously hot. And viewers, if you see, I've been wiping all the time is because of the heat that is generated in this studio. So I hope my host will talk to the owners of this uh, facility so that when I come, I can enjoy a little more comfort when I speak to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anil. Viewers, we encourage you to stay safe, especially during this coronavirus pandemic that is plaguing the world. And uh, to our supporters, continue to stay calm. The People's Progressive Party, Civic, and our leaders continue to fight for you every day in this struggle for democracy to get an illegitimate government out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. <laughs>